Well, right now, I'm working on uh, her show in Cologne. Yeah. And it has color. So really, all of this work I was doing before, other than the red iron oxide, mm. there's not much color to speak of in my work. Um, uh, and these paintings, I've uh, poured chemicals on. Inks also, pigment, and um, varnish. So the varnish that I was using to to adhere the silver spreads all around mm. and you know as you say it's tricky there I do want some things to happen again and I can't do it you know oh, it's like really? the, they're there and they're gone it's, yeah. it's hard to control uh, but other new surprises come in terms of the varnish sitting on the canvas it, it pours off and it does different things yeah. or you know sometimes I get beautiful washes and other times you know not mm. And I've thrown things in it. I was working in the studio this summer, I know, a garage, and uh, there's a gravel uh, drive, so I got little bits of the gravel and threw it on, and then the way it pools around those and so mm. on. So some of that I can see, and some of it you, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so, you know, that was that kind of play. And then I curated a show way back in um, 1990. Uh, with John Cage, uh, uh, Tom Mariani, uh, it's not alphabetical, I'm doing Anastasi, Lynn mm. Anastasi, uh, Barbara Aschenberg, and um, did I leave somebody else? Mark Tilby, mm. and then myself. And the reason I picked those works were that, or those artists, was because they were in John Cage's collection. Mm. And I had mentioned it to John, I said, you know, why don't you curate a show based on chance? And, he, and we would go to many exhibitions with him. We were very lucky to be part of his life, really seven days a week. Mm. Bill would play chess with him for 15 years, virtually every seven, seven mm. days. You know, I joke, I say, well, I felt like Princess Diana had three in this marriage. No sex, but three <laughs> in this marriage. It was a bit much. Yeah, yeah. And we weren't married for 42 years, but three in this relationship. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'd say, well, you know, it's five o'clock, can we, can we do something together, or why do we have to cut off at four o'clock, oh, you know, it's a, it, much as I loved it, but I thought three days, four days, five days is fine, <laughs> seven days, Yeah, it was really affecting. When were you living nearby as well? Not so far, but not yeah. so close either. Yeah, yeah. We were at 141st, and he was on 18th. Right. So okay. it was, yeah, you know, a deal. Weird. And then originally he was down on Bank Street, so it was way when he was Bank is in another 18 blocks lower. Mm. So it was a subway ride for Bill. Yeah, so you had to, that's why mm. he developed the subway drawings to of use course. the time, yeah. Yeah. use the time. And he said, mm. you know, he did some in the 60s, but they those we don't really see very much of. There were very few, and it was not not something he concentrated on yeah. until he had these trips with Cage in '77. That's what really sparked them and he's done them continuously since yeah so um so cage then uh really uh rauschenberg once said to uh john that um you couldn't do a hundred percent chance work and i thought oh well there's a challenge mm. that i could and and once john cage identified he said something very interesting about rauschenberg's work yeah. In some ways, almost a kind of the way he said it, a little bit of a of a. It was a hint of criticism is too hard a word, but something mm. in that direction where he would say, "There's the grit. There's always the grit. There's the grit," and he was liking much more amorphous work without yeah. that. Yeah. So what I happened to be doing with the chemicals really appealed to him because there wasn't. At first I had a grid. Well, I, there, I mean, the, what he says in my catalog that I had asked him to talk to Thomas McEvely about, he, because at first I had built these silver works with the full square. Mm. Just because I was, uh, you know, it was more economic to use the whole damn thing than to mm. break it up. And, uh, you know, it was too cheap to, to, to break it up at first. And then I began to do that, because I did also want to get away from the grid. But so he liked this work, there was no grid, and then the grid emerged. Mm. So, uh, 
there was that influence by Cage, certainly, and his devotion to chance, and he, he felt, I think from his point of view, he felt like, oh, well, huh, that would be great, I have an, an acolyte, I can, my idea, somebody's listening, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and so he, he liked to work very much, which I gave to him later at Christmas, so we celebrated holidays, and, and yeah. we were very, he was very undomestic, really, before he became sort of, so to speak, Either it was a double date with John and Merce and Bill and Dove, or it was like uh, you know family, you yeah. know holidays where they, yeah. you know, John was forty years older than I am. I am well, well was you know our stretch was, mm. and um, so what I thought was I'd ask John, you know, what. And I took Rauschenberg's challenge that he could make 100%, I thought, chance work. Mm. Of course, it's, you know, say 100%. I knew there was going to be a rectangle. I knew that it was silver. I knew yeah. it was going to be on linen. So given that mm. structure uh, that the exterior was in. Uh, since then, with the bullets that I have 3D printed there, you know, they're, they're, the structure is just that it's going to be a bullet mm. that's shot. But from there... Uh, and I'm doing editing because I am selecting bullets that have uh, I, I've looked at and and I've uh, liked the you know the way it twists and turns mm. and so on. I, I've been attracted to that. So that's you know it's not like just walking down the street and finding a bullet. I did select. So there's an editing. Mm. But other than that, the uh, interior composition is completely uh, chance. I was thinking as well because you, so, there must be there must be some bullets that would have just not survived the process that would have fragmented. Yeah, um, yeah not a be, lot because they're yeah. lead and they seem you know against a steel plate. Yeah, there are yeah. some. Yes, they're fragments certainly, and some one I cast was a double bullet, one right. adhered to the other oh, right. and stayed. Yeah, which happens too. They're clumps. I didn't do a whole yeah. clump yet. Yeah, uh, but I did do a double. Mm. And. Uh, so I cast it in, or I had a 3D print blown up, 3D printed 30 mm. times, so it's about, you know, <clears throat> it's about uh, 30 inches, in fact. And then uh, I learned you could uh, metal plate mm. uh, resin. Mm. So it's this ABS resin. So that was, a, you know, a new, another, another way. I mean, that would be great if I had the funds to make them room, you know, huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine, you know. That would be great, you yeah. know. So I mean, actually, I also like them this scale. That yeah. Look, you're sitting in a chair. You can look down at it. It's yeah. you know in a space. It's occupying the space. It makes you look on the on the ground. Mm. And of course, you know you don't need a pedestal. Although when I showed them, some of them are well. I've shown them both on the ground and the pedestal. Mm. But to to look at the, so then I did this show in 1990. Yeah. And I had uh, I looked through. John Cage's collection, and he was a target. He got a lot of work from various artists, mm. and I selected works from that group that I mentioned, yeah. who who used chants, mm. and then and whose work I particularly responded to. And uh, so then, uh, I wrote a catalog essay about it. For first, I asked you know, if he he would be interviewed. So back in 1990, when he was alive. Yeah. He was interviewed about these particular artists because he collected them. Mm -hmm. Why did he collect them and why was he attracted or what, what, what was his thinking about it? And so that was um, part of the interview. Uh, Richard Castellanos, who interviewed him a great deal, talked mm -hmm. to him. And then uh, when I returned to it 24 years later, a couple of years ago, uh, I, um, I wrote about the works and changed all the works. Everything was different except for one work we we were able to somebody else bought it after cage died it was bought and then we borrowed it back mm. but all, other than that all the works were um different works and uh with the same principles so that in this selection there were uh what what interested me was what strategies it's the title the subtitle was strategies of non-intention yeah. The artists, uh, uh, you know, collected by John Cage, mm. then stra colon strategies of non-intention, and um, th and there there were uh, materials, composition, mm. programmed work, uh, um, you know, found material that's distressed, um, 
and, and uh, almost totally unaltered by that was Rauschenberg mm. uh, in the first show and the second and that was in Cage's collection in the second uh, I found uh, uh, th this uh, work where he would do those transfers on fabric and then it was aleatory oh, yeah. when you walk around it would move and he had different weights of fabric and he had different uh, he had a newspaper scrumpled up so that it behaved differently from the rest of the material, mm. but you wouldn't really know how. And um, so those were uh, wonderful to explore. And I pitched this idea just recently to uh, the Louisiana Museum. I was invited to do it by mm. somebody who was not, he had, he had a very good friend, he was a very good friend of a collector, uh, sorry, of a curator at yeah. Louisiana. And I'd done a lot of work in. Uh, Denmark over the years, so I was somewhat known there. And this uh, curator had no seen my shows there, and he'd seen shows of William Anastasi. And he certainly knew Cage, Toby, Marioni, and Rauschenberg, of course. Yeah. And many of them were in the collection. Well, uh, he, he didn't go for it. And I thought, it's really too bad. None of us, if, if it would be, a, I think it's a very good idea. And I'm actually going to work with the Katie and Anya. We're going to work because I don't, I don't want to do all that work and research. You know, I'm doing my own work, and yeah. I'm not. You know, I did a curating by the by because it was close and it came out of my life, yeah. and um, you know, and I knew Cage's collection very well, and and him, yeah. and so on, and these are various artists I had also. I didn't meet Toby, but the others I well, I knew. Yeah, and so. Uh, so I thought, well, she can do another aspect of it. Like, there's many, many tons of people who are doing this mm. kind of work. I mm. mean, even Mozart threw dice, and so you know, there's there's lots of strategies. Phil threw dice for the, the you know, which is a wonderful chance piece because it looks yeah. very controlled. Yeah. You, you know, the die is six sides, one die, and so a mark can go on the top and all four sides, and then crisscross, there's six. Mm. And so, of course, it's a grid, but it's all chance mm. where mm. the lines go, and then it makes different patterns. So that was really beautiful, clever, uh, you know, use mm. uh, of something that's geometric, but look, you know, that's random. Yeah. And so there are so many ways. So I think it would be a terrific show. And the curator said this, um, he said, that it was an appealing idea, but um, it was, what did he say? What was the exact word? He said it wasn't um, something like there, there wasn't enough um, anticipation or juice or response. You know, people were not going to really get into it. Yeah. And I thought, that's such a shame that they don't trust their audience because the I audience. Say that's a big assumption to make, but. Yeah, well, because none of us are like the hot artists right now. So, mm. you know, everybody wants the same old, same old. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we have the, the celebrated group. We don't even have to mention who they are, but they're in all the shows. They move all over the world. All the museums have to have a piece of theirs. The mm. public knows the name, so therefore they come in. Yeah. And it's not concept based. It's just like politics. Look at what we, you know, it'll be political for a moment, but we just went through a really awful American election. Totally, yeah. totally embarrassing, and beyond that, just so sad, mm. so terribly sad, mm. that that it all devolved around personalities instead of issues. And so yeah. much of the art world, you know, here's a really gritty I issue, and this was my pitch. I said, you know, how surprising it is to use these methods to uh, make work and beauty could be created by somebody who doesn't even look at the work. Yeah. That's Bill. You know, or somebody who doesn't even control it, you know, in the normal way. There are no brushes. You're just, you know, mm. and yet something can be very beautiful and look um, resolved. And so, you know, you could pitch it, which I did in this way, that, but it was based on ideas, not on, you know, Cage is still not the big main draw in the world. People don't know who he is. Mm. And yet his ideas dominated the art world from, you know, really 40s, 30s on. And, 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 and music world, he, yeah, was, he was the one who was organizing what he called experimental music. And I'm just reading his letters now.
mm. uh, which Laura Kuhn brilliantly um, collated and annotated. They're just amazing. And, mm. and what you see is how much effort he expended, how he tried to uh, develop a scene, how he tried to get the ear of these universities. No, you know, they were kind of sort of and somewhat mm -hmm, and they didn't have money mm -hmm. and it never happened. He wanted in a university uh, an experimental, uh, you know, arts, uh, uh, experimental music, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, center. And, um, and so he, and, and the amount of work that he did to organize ex, uh, uh, concerts, he was the ringleader. Mm. And I didn't even read that book when I did this show, but I knew that for my own work to get somehow in the dialogue, which you know, anybody who's um, moderately ambitious or ambitious at all, mm. you know, you want to be in the swim where, oh, this relates to that and this yeah. person is thinking this way and that is an idea to run with. And so um, I thought that... Um, that I would contextualize my work that way and put mm. myself, make my own group. Nobody's come along and said, oh, this is how you go with that one and that one. Nobody's done it mm. for me. Mm. And so I didn't just sit on my hands and wait till it happened. You know, I'm already, you know, a couple of years from 70, mm. you know. And so I started to, the kind of framing that you do of your work, which is, uh, you know, literally put one on. Uh, so that determines how it's seen or where it's seen. That's the frame of the place. There's Bill Anastasi floating in and out. He should just shadow by here since he's mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then, uh, then the further context, of course, is who who you're influencing mm -hmm. and, and what's going on and what's overlooked. You know, I, I mean, as a woman, I was thinking, I would like to do some research, I'm sure it's out there, of these artists who like uh, Frida Kahlo. Yeah. Diego Rivera was the big cheese at yeah. the time. Yeah. He was the one everybody paid attention to. He did these huge murals and so on. But Frida Kahlo, was, she was, uh, Kahlo, she was personal. She was, everybody has pain, she's mm. talking the personal. And it wasn't so nobody collected of the important people at the time. And, and she was kind of a side act. And yeah. now, this is what people, our young artists, are looking at, what audiences yeah. finally have known and want to see. And, you know, she had another advantage, she had portable works. Unlike yeah. Diego's yeah. stuff, you have to see, mm. uh, you know, it's painted out in Rockefeller Center, and, mm. and, and they're big murals, unless you've been to Mexico, you, don't, you, don't, you haven't seen them, mm. only in reproduction. And interesting, yeah. I suppose, that back in those days, he was doing institutional sort of Yes, Art. and then the other thing he yeah. had is, you yeah. know, to be, you know, he had the shtick of, you know, communism and workers. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is a, it's a more political, narrower subject yeah. than Frida Kahlo's work, which was about, you know, suffering of, of a person. Yeah. An individual, that's everybody, you know. Yeah. And so there are a lot of people who don't relate to the communist uh, agenda that he had yeah. in the same visceral way. There are yeah. plenty of people who are, in, who do because that's their lot, mm. you know, and they're they're um, and they're unfortunate. Uh, but you know, yeah. no, it doesn't grip you to the heart and the soul the way yeah. hers did. And so I thought that was very interesting, and that's true with a lot of women who are like working all along, mm. you know. And Dorothea Tanning had this with Max Ernst; he's the big guy, yeah, and uh, grabbed all the attention. And a number of years ago. Uh, I went to the Tate, and I saw uh, her the, their, the, the work of um, the Surrealist. There was a whole wall of mm. Surrealist art there. Yeah. And I have to say, the work that I liked the most was one of hers that was, I've forgotten the title, but it was a, a folded, uh, you, you know, beautifully painted um, tablecloth with surreal things. That's all I remember of yeah. it. But the light and the way she painted it and the kind of magic. You know, I can't even remember the main mm. magic of it. Just that was what struck me.